Okay, so with our medical office now, the first thing we're going to do is start adding some actual model objects, right? So I can do that if I right-click models and go add class. They're just simple classes, right? In fact, uh, you'll hear this term POCO, P-O-C-O, -O, plain old CLR object, right? In other words, it's a simple class. It doesn't inherit from anything fancy, right? Uh, so I have two in my medical office. I've done medical office. You've done that scenario before in the classroom example. I'm sure in some course at some point. If not, it's just doctor as many patients, and a patient has one primary care physician assigned, right? Not that a patient in an emergency can't see more than one doctor, but there's one doctor that's like the family doctor, right? So I'll have a doctor class, and I might as well add the patient class. So I'll add another class for patient. Okay, now here's where my uh, uh, copy-paste files will come in handy. But, you know, before I even get to that, let me um, start off just in code itself, right? So if this class is eventually going to become something persisted in the database, okay, most entities, just like our tables in SQL Server, there's a requirement to have a unique identifier, a way to identify each row uniquely. We often refer to that as what? What kind of key? What kind of key? Primary key. Primary key, exactly, right? So I need to add a property that can relate to a concept of a primary key. Now, of course, we've seen in the past, you can, primary keys can be anything. They can be a uh, n bar char type or, you know, one thing or another. But quite often what's used in a dual key system is a programmer's key, something convenient like a GUID maybe, or even just an integer, right? When we make an integer primary key, it would often also be in SQL Server an identity. Remember that term? What is an identity? <laughs> it's kind of like an auto number, right? It generates the values for you. So as you insert a record, you don't have to specify. If you have, you know, doctors one, two, and three already, then the next doctor you insert would probably get ID four, right? It automatically generates those numbers. By the way, they'll never be reused. So if doctor three leaves the clinic and you delete his record eventually, uh, then that ID of three would never be created again, right? But, you know, it does automatically the identity. You can set a seed in an increment. Remember, one and one are the defaults. But, you know, you can have a different increment go up by five every time if you want <laughs> for whatever reason and so on and so forth. So to get a property that would correspond to that, I can very simply create a simple integer. Now, I should maybe ask how familiar I've used these snippets that are built into Visual Studio very much. There's all kinds of code snippets. So if I type P-R-O-P, you see I have a selection of different ones. For example, if I go down to prop full and go tab, tab, it puts this little snippet in for the full expression of a property in a C-sharp object, right? So there's my public getter and setter as a property and a private variable to hold the value. Okay, this is maybe how in your uh, C-sharp course last term you did a lot of your properties, right? Okay, no? Well, there's a simplified version. Instead of breaking it out in full like this, I can just go prop, tab, tab, and then this is a simplified property, right? By the way, they compile down exactly the same way. This will create an internal private variable. It's just we don't have to worry about seeing it, right? But in the end, it works exactly the same way as that full property snippet I just showed you. But it's kind of nice that it gives me this, and then it even helps me write it. Notice it's highlighted the data type, so I can quickly change that if I want, or I can just press tab to go over to the next thing to change, right? It would be the name. Now, here's the key that I want to drive home. So I'm designing this property to become essentially like the foreign or primary key, right? There is a naming convention I can follow. Without me having to decorate this in some way and configure that this is going to be the primary key, it can follow a simple naming convention. I have two choices. You can either use the class name, doctor, with ID, the letters ID at the end, and would automatically assume then that I want this to be the primary key. Or my other choice is just ID. I can use either one. Okay. 
There's no real advantage of one or the other. Some people like to use. Uh, actually, there is. There is a tiny advantage. <laughs> if you get into a lot of inheritance, you know, where you have like a person class, and then you might have teachers and, you know, parents and all these other uh, classes with unique properties, but they all inherit from person and so on. Uh, then often actually works out easier if every class just has a uh, primary key of ID. It's actually a little less confusing in your code, trust me. <laughs> okay, but uh, otherwise, you know, both both work for the most part, right? So that's it. When I ask Entity Framework to take my class and build tables based on it, it will actually set that up as a primary key integer identity for me without me having to do anything else. So let's say the, the next thing I might want to have is a first name, right? I can do the same thing, prop, tab, tab. This would be a string. Because remember, I am working in C sharp. Tab again over to first name. And I'm hitting the end key to get to the end of the line and push enter. Because once I push enter, then it takes off all the highlighting. It's out of that mode where it's helping me sort of define the aspects of the property, right? Okay. Now let's talk about what would happen here. As this goes to the database, it's a string. String is the data type in C sharp. What data type do you think it would be inside of SQL Server? Yeah, it'll be a bar chart. What size? Ah, there's the rub. What's the biggest in bar chart you can have? Ah, no. In bar chart max. In bar chart max can actually hold like. 10 copies of Encyclopedia Britannica. Don't quote me, but <laughs> my point is it's massive. Gigabytes of, of data, right, in a single field. And that's what the system will default to because it doesn't know how big your string might be, right? So fortunately, we have ways to kind of fine tune and help out Entity Framework in this business of mapping this to a table. We can use annotations. Now, those that had me for the Prog 1198, I quickly showed you using some annotations on properties in a class, but maybe not everybody has seen it before. There's a namespace. If I go back to Blackboard for a second, you'll see that back in the weekly content, that's actually, it's also in the content categories, but uh, down here I put a link to data annotations reference. Now, this is a complete Bible on everything about annotations. Right. Very extensive coverage, hundreds and hundreds here talked about. Um, this is an article talking more specifically about model validation using uh, annotations inside .NET Core. Right? So this one might be the better one for you to read through initially. But uh, there's lots of resources for you, but I'm just going to walk you through a couple to begin with. Let's say, for example, well, we'll, we'll finish the size issue. Right? How am I going to tell the database what the size should be? Well, maybe I will actually say, first of all, it's required. Can't have a doctor without a first name, right? Well, I can put the square brackets, okay? Those are the ones that are, well, square. <laughs> and I'll say required. Now it's going to yell at me. Dave, what are you talking about? Required, right? It's red underlined, okay? Well, that's because, although the, uh, the project has a DLL that supports that namespace system dot data annotations, et cetera, et cetera, component model data annotations. I haven't referenced it with a using in my class yet. Do I have to remember the whole spelling of that? Well, actually, IntelliSense helps you with it, but still, nonetheless, there's a shortcut. Notice this little yellow light bulb over here. Okay, so your potential fixes in your code. If I click the drop down list, it has a couple different ideas. Oh. Why not just add the using for system component model data annotations, right? That would be perfect way to fix it, right? Um, or I could even specifically just, you know, inside of adding the using, I could fully qualify, say, system component model data annotations dot required, right? That would be another fix. But I'm going to be using annotations all over, so the first one is preferable. Or it says, hey, if that's not the one you're after, you have to generate your own type called required, right? Now, one of the nice things, this little yellow light bulb, he runs and hides. Every time I try to click him with the mouse, he moves somewhere else on me. So let me just share a keyboard shortcut. Wherever there's the red underline, if you hold control period, remember, control period. It's going to be your friend for the rest of your programming life with Visual Studio. Control period also brings up the same <laughs> list. 
So if you're like me and you're awkward with the mouse, it's often easier with control period. But I'm basically by adding the using at the top of the class, it will resolve and say, oh, okay, now I know what you mean because you're using that data annotations namespace, right? All right, so now in the database, being required means what, what aspect of the field in the table in SQL Server? If it's required, it will be what? Remember, not null? Not null, right. So these annotations allow us to take some control of how the table will be built inside of SQL Server. Okay? And then I can say string length. See, now that I've got the namespace, I get IntelliSense for my annotations here. So string length, okay, I hit a round bracket, and then there's all kinds of IntelliSense. I can specify a maximum length. So, I don't know, how many characters do I need for a first name? 50 should probably be enough, I'm guessing. I can always change it later, right? Okay, so that's it. So now, at this stage, it will not only be an nvar char, it'll be an nvar char 50, and it'll be marked not null, right? But these annotations are not just for controlling or hinting how the database should be created. They also work as you move towards the front end, right? So what if I leave it blank on a web form that I'm filling out okay, around the world, right, for my server? Wouldn't it be nice to give them some feedback immediately to say, well, this information is required? Well, look at this. Error message equals uh, the first name of the doctor, I'm being very wordy, cannot be left blank. And always, you should always be very friendly in your error messages, right? So I'm making it clear, okay? Now the beauty of adding this error message is it will be used everywhere throughout the system. Whenever somebody leaves us blank on a hundred different forms I might have, if they ever leave it blank in an edit or in an insert, doesn't matter, right? They'll get this error message, whatever I put here. So it's another great example of that dry, don't repeat yourself concept. If you can put some information in one place in your code, that gets utilized throughout the entire project, that's a very good thing, right? Okay, and I can do the same thing down here. If I hit comma, notice that there's all kinds of ones suggested, but we're using name parameters now, so I can give an error message for the length. Uh, first name, too long. <laughs> okay, I'm getting tired of writing long messages, so, right? So I can give an error message for just about everything I put an annotation on. But that's not all, right? This field, first name, that property name, that works fine as the name of a column in a database table and so on, but it certainly is not what you would want to appear in a label on a web page in front of a client, right? That doesn't look very professional. Look at this annotation. I don't know why I always put it at the top. The order of the annotations does not matter, right? as long as they're above the property, yeah. So I can set display name equals, and I can here, I can put a nice space. First name, I can say first name of the doctor if I wanted, but that would be a little bit verbose, okay? So I can do all that with these simple annotations, and they affect, some of them affect how the data repository, how the database will be created, but also they can affect how the user interface will present information to the client. Right? Okay. So what I'm going to do is over in my copy paste file, you see I had a version without any annotations and then versions with, right? So I was going to do it first without and then show you that it makes an invar char max, but to save some time, you know, I don't think I really have to go through that step. So we're going to jump to the versions here that actually have the annotations. So I'm going to take a couple more, right here for the middle name and the last name. So that's all we have for a doctor, really, is the first, middle, and last name of the doctor, right? You'll notice a difference here, the middle name, okay? I don't say required, right? Because I want to leave it null. Now, that works as well because the string, as a data type, allows nulls. But are you aware that that's an exception in C-sharp? Most data types in C-sharp 
okay, reference types and so on, are they never allow null values, like an integer or int 64, decimal, you know, whatever, date time. They don't allow null in C sharp. So we'll have to see later on that there's a trick we can do to work around that. But string fortunately does. So just by not saying required, I don't have to supply a middle name, right? Down here, I'm doing the same kind of thing for the last name. I'm allowing 100 characters in case they have a really long last name. I think that's usually enough. And I've got display names on all of them. Okay, so that's good for now. Let's go over to the patient. I'll just save that. Now I'm going to go down. I'm going to grab pretty much everything for the patient class and bring it over at once. Out of my copy-paste file. Now there's going to be blood everywhere on the screen, but don't panic. All I have to do is click anywhere, go control period, add my using for system component model data annotations, right? Once I do that, all that red underlining goes away. Okay, so notice again, I just have int id. That'll be my primary key, right? Doesn't matter that they're both named id because they're in separate tables. Okay, here's something new. For our OHIP number, I'm storing it as a string, even though it's a number, but you know, it's really just a collection of characters. But to make sure that they enter 10 digits, not nine, not 11, and no character except a digit, I can use, look at that, a regular expression, okay? So that's another one of the annotations available, okay? Now, in terms of the string that makes it the regular expression, everyone's had at least seen regular expressions before, am I correct? Because you did that regular expression co validation control in web forms at the very least, right? You, you, you've seen them quickly. Well, don't worry, there's not too many we need. This just means digits only, characters, and 10 of them, exactly 10. Right? The only thing that's a little different about this string and what you would get off of a site like regex.com is the two backslashes. There would normally be one backslash. But this string is a C-sharp string. Right? In C-sharp, the backslash character is used as the escape character. So in order to actually say, I want one of these characters, you have to put two in a row. <laughs> that's how you work around that. Okay. But it's great to be able to use regular expressions. Um, let me see. The name is exactly the same as the doctor, first, middle, last. Oh, okay, here we go. The date of birth, okay? I used to hand out a scenario for this, but most people have seen the doctor-patient scenario in at least one of the other courses they've done coming up to this one. So usually we allow the date of birth to be null, right? If in an emergency you're entering a patient's information, if you don't have their date of birth, you don't want to be prevented from creating the record, you can always fill it in later, right? So, to allow a null date time, there's two approaches. I could put nullable in front, right? Or, I probably spelled it wrong or something. The lazy way, and you know me, I'm lazy, <laughs> is to put the question mark at the end of the data type. That makes it a nullable type, even though a date time itself will not accept nulls. When you make a nullable type, whether it's integer, date time, whatever, it actually has a few extra properties will show up when you go dot, right? Uh, it'll have things like has value, will be true or false. And that's the way you can examine to see if it's null or not. There's another one called dot get value or default. So that way, if it is null, it returns the default value for the underlying date type, right? You know, for an integer, it would return zero, things like that. Okay. All right, so that allows it to be in that, and I don't have a required attribute, so we don't have to give the date time. But let's look at what else is here. Ooh, it's the first time we've seen this, a data type annotation. We're saying specifically the data type is a date, right? Putting that on here, even without a, any kind of a format string, would mean that and not only is it, created in the database, but in the user interface, it will actually show as a short date format. It, you know, normally a date time has got all those ugly looking hours, minutes, second, milliseconds, right? Which are usually just defaulted to basically midnight, zero, 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 zero right? Uh, so we don't have to show that just by saying it's date. Plus, this will cause the user interface to also put that type HTML attribute in place. So that modern browsers that support HTML5, like Chrome and so on, will have that little date control 
right? The little pop drop down calendar thing, right? And that comes from just having that in place. Now, since I talked about that, I probably have to talk about this. Display format allows me to have a data format string. You've used data format strings in C sharp before, right? Any numeric value, you can specify a data format string. Date values, numeric values, whatever. So this one forces it to display as the four digit year, dash two digit month, dash two digit day. And let me point out, I'll just zoom back out again. There's an option here, apply format in edit mode, which is true or false, right? So that means that even in edit mode, we want it to display in the same format, right? Year, month, day. Now, the only reason why this is actually a requirement to have here, because as I said, data type dot date will already put it into a, a short date format. The reason I have to have this is Google Chrome. <laughs> if you're populating a form with existing data and there's a value for the date of birth, with Chrome, because it has that little calendar control, right? unless the date is formatted specifically like this, it won't show. All you'll see are the placeholder characters, year, 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 month, month, day, day. It won't show you the actual data value unless, it's right in Chrome's documentation, unless the data is formatted in this specific way. So to work around Chrome's issue, <laughs> we have to specify this specific date format. Okay, a couple more examples of uh, useful annotations in here. Uh, this uh, expected yearly visits, right? Uh, I just, I know it's a stupid concept, but the idea is that, you know, a patient, how often do we expect them to come to the doctor's office? Once a year, twice a year, right? I just made that up <laughs> working on this late at night one night because I was trying to think of something where I could put a range validation requirement, right? So I have a range of 1 to 12. The number of expected visits must be between 1 and 12. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I know it's kind of a stupid concept, but I couldn't think of anything better that would require a range of values. So forgive me, all right? Okay. So that just shows another type of uh, annotation that we can use to get validation in the client, giving an error message. So if the client browser supports it, it'll use jQuery validation. It'll show the messages instantly without even going back to the server. Everything is always double checked on the server, just as we talked about last term with web forms and those validation controls. Okay, oh, we're almost done, but the phone number might be worth discussing. Notice that there's a data type for phone number. Okay, so in the client browser, if uh, somebody has Skype or something on their system where they can actually click a link to make a phone call, it'll appear as a link and they can do, do that, right? Uh, I'm using a regular expression because I'm setting it up so that they type the digits only, right? Enter a 10-digit phone number, no spaces, special characters, right? So that way I can just use the exact same 10 ex regular expression I do for OHIP numbers, right? Now to store it though, as 10 digits as an integer value, notice I had to go to int64, because a regular 32-bit integer isn't big enough to hold a number that large. So I had to go to a larger integer data type. And I'm using the display format because I like to see a phone number that looks, you know, with the area code in the round brackets and the dash between the different portions and so on, right? So my display format will show it that way, right? Whenever I'm just displaying the number. Notice I have this Boolean apply format in edit mode set to false. Because when we're editing it, remember we have to type it without any special characters or spaces. So you know, I don't want it to look that way when we're editing it. Any questions? Yeah. What is that zero calling? Oh, okay. Uh, when any data format string, this uh, <laughs> this refers to the index of the uh, string. So if you, you might have d two or three different, oh. right? So just saying the first one. So that's all. Okay. Index zero. Okay, and lastly we have an email. Notice the data type is email address. So again, it'll appear as a link on the user interface and you can click on it, bring up your mail client, Outlook, whatever you're using, okay, to actually send the email. All right, so that's all the annotations that we've kind of talked about. There's some good examples of different ones there for you, which is why I'm doing it, right? Give you some examples, but you have the references. You can also add additional ones as required. So here we come down to the rub.
I have two classes, doctor and patient. We've talked about the fact that logically we want them to relate to each other in a one-to-many relationship. A doctor has many patients, a patient has one family doctor, right? Primary care physician, whatever. Well, how do we actually tell when it goes to the database, tell the system about that arrangement, that that's how they should relate to each other? The answer, believe it or not, is just as one line would be sufficient. By putting a virtual parent object inside the child object, the patient, by putting a doctor object inside here, that actually will tell Entity Framework when it goes to the database that this is the child in the relationship between the two. It's a one-to-many relationship. The, by the way, the keyword virtual here, just you've heard of override, like you can override methods and so on. Well, to override a property, it has to be a virtual property. Right? So this gives Entity Framework the ability to override the uh, doctor and take control of it. Right? That's all that virtual does. People sometimes wonder, you know, does that mean that do we have to put on 3D glasses to see the doctor? On? No, no, nothing like that. Okay. Now the truth is, though, when it creates the foreign key inside the patient table for the doctor, it's going to be an integer, just as you did, right? It'll be the same data type as the primary key in the parent table. So if all we put in here, although it works, it creates the relationship, the system itself will make up its own name for the corresponding integer foreign key in the patient table that it can use to relate back to the doctor's primary key. Right? So instead of letting it do that, and we won't even necessarily know what name it uses, we can do this. Okay? Again, a naming convention comes into play. Doctor is the parent class in the foreign primary foreign key relationship. Right? So doctor ID is the name, the natural name to use for the foreign key. Right? I don't have to, I could annotate it to say it's the foreign key, but I don't need to following that naming convention. Right? So I'm putting a required, well, integer is required anyway. I'm only doing it so I have a chance to specify my own error message. You must select a primary care physician. Otherwise, the system will generate one that says something like, uh, the integer field doctor ID cannot be left null. <laughs> right? So it's a little more friendly to give my own message, that's all. And a display name kind of helps, otherwise it'll just show doctor ID on the page, right? Which again, isn't very user friendly. Okay, so that's the key, really. These two combined make it possible for us then to have access to the foreign key value within the patient as well. And that makes it much easier to program, much easier, right? So this is what we often call a navigation property. It gives us the ability to do things like uh, dot include. So when we select data using our language integrated query, I can say, well, give me this patient, but dot include his doctor. And when an instantiator builds this object with all the data from the database for this one patient, it would actually create the doctor object and insert it as an object inside. And it's all self-contained, gets returned by the database, and I have all the information eagerly loaded that I want. Right? So the final thing I'm going to talk about then before we wrap up our model discussion, give me two more minutes here, is wouldn't it be nice if the doctor had a navigation property like that as well? Whereas if I instantiate a doctor object, I can immediately have it load the whole collection of patients that the doctor looks after, right? Well, to do that, you might have noticed I left it out when I copied and pasted earlier. All I need is a property here in the doctor, uh, I collection of patient objects. I'll just call it patients, right? That's what we do. When you have a collection of objects, you usually need to pluralize the name, okay? So I have a collection of patient objects. I'll call it patients. Now it's virtual, so it can be overridden. It can be left, if, you know, by default, it'll be a null, right? There'll be nothing in it when I instantiate. Uh, and that's the one reason for my last bit of code. My last bit of code will be this. I'm going to, in the constructor, you know what a constructor is, right? Okay, everyone's nodding, good. Okay, so the constructor, public, doctor. I don't need any parameters for it, okay? But the constructor gives me a chance to, when I'm building or instantiating one of these objects, add a little bit of code. Something I want to do, well, I want to initiate or initialize my patient collection stored internally to an empty collection of patients. I do this just so it's not null, okay? 
99% of the time, this is not important. But that 1% of the time, it's a real pain. <laughs> that 1% of the time comes up if, for some reason in code, you actually have to access, you instantiate a doctor object, and you go encode doctor.patients. Well, if you didn't instantiate it with something, you'd get a null reference exception, right, if it's still null. So that's all this is for, is to avoid null reference exceptions for any references to the patient's collection of the doctor. All right. So it actually does come up uh, in the type of coding we do sometimes. So it's important that we uh, include this as well. So in the constructor, whenever you have a collection, okay, you should, good programming practice, to instantiate it. Now, why a hash set? Anybody have a guess? Why not a list, for example? Make a new empty list of patient objects. I just wondered if anybody... It's just because it's empty anyway, right? <laughs> but it's the lightest weight collection you can have, okay? List has a lot of overhead, right? So the, the most lightweight, performance-wise, collection you can have is a hash set. So since we're not using it, it, it'll get replaced with a real collection of patient objects if we ever actually utilize it, uh, then it might as well just be something very small and lightweight in the meantime. That's all. I'm just trying to anticipate what your questions would be and give you answers ahead of time. All right, so that's our, that completes our discussion of these two okay, objects. After the break, we'll actually see what we can do with them and how Entity Framework can help us actually create the database.